Hey, would you do me a favor before you sit down? Would you look at the person beside you? And I want you to tell them the title of my sermon today. I want you to look at them and say, watch him whip. Do that. Tell them. Look at him and say, watch him whip. High five somebody before you're seated. Watch him whip. How many of you, uh, how many of y'all are familiar with the whip and nay nay? Anybody here familiar with the whip and nay nay? Two people. You. All right. Starting to see, starting to see. Y'all want to see me do it? I'll make you a deal. If y'all talk back enough to me today during this message, I might put it in some point in, in the point of the message. Um, so stop it. Don't even, uh, go get you some Crocs. Don't come at me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> security, security. Um, so good to see you this morning. I'm so excited for you to be here. Whether or not, or let's put it like this, we're all raised differently. And so because of how we are raised, I think we all develop this picture of who Jesus is, right? Uh, some of us, because of the way we were raised, Jesus is the one who loves the little children, all the children of the world, black and, or red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight, children of the world. Half of you are like, what is happening? This is a cult. What is wrong with these people? Who is red and who is yellow? What is happening right now? Right? Uh, so so that, for some of us, that's the picture of Jesus that we have. For some of us, the only picture of Jesus we have is the one that Grandma had in her hallway, right? Whenever we would walk down that creepy hallway, they had pictures of everybody, right? Like, this was before wall decor existed, so you just had pictures of everybody. Like, who's this? Like, that's your third cousin's auntie's uncle who used to walk their dog on Tuesday. Like, what is happening? Why do we have a picture of this person? But, but, but despite what your picture might be of Jesus, I want, I want to read some scripture to you today. It's going to be the scripture that we really uh, found or, or we really build today's message on. And I, I want to read it to you, and then I want to go from there. So it's in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. So just five verses that are really going to set us up for today. But something happens in these verses that might alter the picture you have of Jesus. And so it says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, that was a particular time, of the year, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the temple courts, which would have been modern, would have been the church of the day, he found people, watch this, selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all of them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. And he scattered the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Regardless of what your picture of Jesus is, what happens to that picture when you read about Jesus flipping tables and whipping back and forth, right? right? Where, where, where does your mind go? Whether it's the all red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Whether it's the picture you saw of Jesus where he's like blonde haired and blue eyes, which is completely not true. And he's like sitting there with a lamb, you know, draped across his lap. Like whatever your picture of Jesus is, what happens to it when you read him walking in there with a whip and like, which guy, Indiana Jones in it up all throughout there, and then flipping tables, right? It, it, it can kind of, ooh, wait a minute. And this is kind of the tension in the Bible that causes people to go, hey, what you're saying doesn't always line up with I read, what I read, and, and, and let me help you out this morning. I think it's important for us to learn how to deal with a Savior who is both powerful and practical. That's important for us to learn. And, and what could have happened in these five scriptures what, what, what did we just read that we don't understand that happened in five scriptures to make good Jesus go gangster, right? Like, like what, what, what could have happened? What, what, what was the transformation moment? And what was happening to Jesus that drove him crazy is often the same thing that happens to us that drives us crazy. And Jesus realized he had to take care of it. And what that was was a culture crisis. Jesus had walked into a culture crisis, 
and it drove him crazy. Before we even move forward anymore, let me help you understand this. You better be okay believing and understanding that we serve a Jesus, watch this, who will cure your condition on Sunday and he will confront your culture on Monday. Right? This is why people enjoy church but don't enjoy Christianity. Because church is often the party, right? Woo! Jesus heals you. Jesus forgives you. Grace, mercy. We're all, wah, yeah, wah, spirit fingers. You know what I mean? Like it's an amazing moment because he will. He will cure your condition. But he also confronts your culture. Because he understands, understands that the long time curing is not in this moment but in your culture. So on Sunday he cures your condition. But on Monday, he confronts your culture. So let me help you out what's happening here in John chapter 2, verse 14. And according to the scriptures, Jesus walks into the temple courts, and here's what he finds. People selling cattle, selling sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. When we first read that, you know, we see this all the time. Y'all ever been to the mall where in the middle of the mall they have the little kiosk, you know what I'm talking about? Where they're always like chasing you down, like, you want a hair perm? You want a hair perm? You're like... Well, yeah, back up off me, bro. Um, we had places in Memphis you could go in, and they would be like, hey, we can get these two diamond earrings. I'd be like, great. I had my ears pierced then. I said, well, how, you know, how much do they cost? They'd be like, $75 for both. And, and I would always bring two $10 bills and put one in this pocket and one in this pocket. And I'd be like, I'll give you $20. And they'd be like, no, 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 you know, $65. And I'd be like, I'll give you $20. I'd be like, no, 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 $45. I'd be like, no, you know what? All I got is $10. I would leave out of there with $75 pair of earrings for $10, right? That's just how it rolled. And so when you read this, it's like, well, what's the problem there? But, but, but you got to help, you got to let me help you understand the culture in that time, okay? Around the time of Passover, it was God's law for the Jewish people to come to the temple and to make a sacrifice via animals. So some were coming to sacrifice sheep, some were coming to sacrifice goats, some were coming to sacrifice doves. And so normally, watch this. We live in an age where we can catch an Uber, right, or, or Lyft, and we would get to the temple, but that, it didn't happen back then. So people had to walk to the temple, and so some would walk for days, and watch this, they'd have to bring with them their sheep or their goats or their doves. So not only are they traveling for days, but they're having to bring all of their animals. And if you are a parent and you've ever had a road trip with your kids, you know that that is an exact or an, an incredible disaster. So going with animals would be that times 10, right? Because they're pooping everywhere and, you know, trying to run away. And so, so these great entrepreneurs had an idea. They said, hey, we can set up in the lobby of the church and we can sell these things, goats and doves and cattle, and people can travel here worry-free. And when they get here, they can buy their animal and they can take their animal into the temple and make a sacrifice. Genius, Right? We had entrepreneurs back then, but somebody got a little greedy and said, hey, I realize we could, we could make a little money off this, add a convenience fee to it, and, and, and come out on the upper end of this. And so that kind of happened, and it got out of hand, and the culture got to a point where they're basically robbing people, and then they decided we can even charge people for exchanging their currency to our currency. And so what was happening is where they were supposed to be having sacrifices to worship God, now they were basically robbing people. So Jesus walks in. Now the verse means something totally different. Jesus walks in and sees this and says, all right, I'm going to have to correct this culture. I want you to understand that culture is way more important than I think we think it is. When we got ready to plant a church, that's what everybody asked us. What about your culture? What about your culture? What about your culture? And, and we were 30. I was 32 at the time. And so, so I'm like, I don't really even know what culture is. And, and I'm just learning more and more that we all have culture. You have culture. I have culture. Your kids have culture. There's a culture in your home. There's a culture in your marriage. When you go on a date, there's a culture in your date. When you listen to music, there's a culture in the kind of music you listen to. There's a culture in the clothes you wear. There's a culture in everything. Listen, where you go to eat today, there will be a culture there. Wherever you go to shop, there's a culture there. Culture is everywhere, and it's up to us to decide if we are going to create our own or if we're just going to adapt to someone else's. Let me give you some examples. There is no better carrier of culture than Chick-fil-A. 
right? I mean, I could drop the microphone and go home. I mean, they have taught us everything. Like, here's how I know Chick-fil-A has a good culture. Because when you go to Chick-fil-A, the line is out of the actual Chick-fil-A parking lot and into the actual oncoming traffic road, and you decide to stay. If there are two people at McDonald's, you're like, we'll never make it. We'll never get our food. We'll have to get our food tomorrow. Because there's a culture there in Chick-fil-A. You know that in like five minutes, I went to Wingstop the other day. I hope nobody from Wingstop watches this. I went to Wingstop. I texted Darla. I said, I'll never come here again. I, I'm so used to going to Chick-fil-A, having my food in like three minutes. It took 20 minutes for me to get some hot wings. That's, that's a culture, right? Chick-fil-A's culture is it's our pleasure. That just goes to show you the culture right there. You could walk into Chick-fil-A, get your food, dump it on the floor, pour your Coke on the woman who just took your order, and smack her in the face, and she'd go, it was my pleasure. <laughs> That's just the culture that they have, right? I, I didn't read the article, I'm not, so I'm not sure if it was real or not, but I saw it pass through Facebook where some Chick-fil-A employee had gone down like a, like a sewer hole to get a customer's phone that they had dropped down the sewer. Help me with that. It's like, would you like cheese on it? Oh, your phone, let me go get your phone, okay? Chick-fil-A culture. Popeye's has a different culture. Y'all know where this is going, right? So I, I, I was out of town with a lot of the directors of the church a while back. We take them to a conference in North Carolina, and, and we got out pretty late from the conference, and we were all in separate vehicles. We went to go get dinner, and four or five of us jumped in one van and said, hey, let's go to Popeye's and get uh, some chicken, right? Some chicken and some, some, some sides or whatever. So we get there. As we pull up, we're the only, the only people there that should have been a sign. We pull in the drive through The guy, the first thing he says is, uh, hey, uh, we got to drop chicken. So it'll be about 30 minutes until we got some food. You got to drop chicken? Your Popeye's chicken. It's not like you have other choices, right? I can't get a burger. Like, I mean, you, when have you ever been to Chick-fil-A and they say, hey, it's going to be about 30 minutes. We got to drop some chicken. Never, right? Here was my favorite part. We told the guy, we said, hey, man, we got about three different orders, okay? <laughs> that, that makes anybody mad. But as soon as we said it, this is all you heard, on the drive through speakers, what you heard? Oh. <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't eat there, all right? So it's just, it's just culture. There's just a difference in culture. Target has a culture, right? Target is the place that people like to go to just to waste time. Ask your wife. Okay. I read an actual article on this that said Target is one of the most popular places for, for it, was, it was specifying women, but, but men too, who just like to go and kind of waste time. And here's some of the reasons they gave. Never thought about this. They said Target has very wide aisles. Like, hmm, okay. They said Target never feels busy, right? Nobody's ever like running around in Target. It's always like, hey, <laughs> what are you looking for? Right? Is it, right now you're like, that is Target. They always play really nice music. It's well lit, you know. It's all that. Walmart, on the other hand, totally different. Their aisles are small. Think about this. This is so psychologically true. It's blowing my mind. You don't care, but it's blowing my mind. They're always busy. As soon as you walk in, people are like, I don't even know. I don't even know. Right? They're just running around crazy. And you're just automatically like, I got to get out of here. I'm going to lose my mind. There's just, there's just this culture. I was born in Memphis. We had a culture. Co Memphis has three cultures, barbecue, music, and murder. That's, that's the three, <laughs> three. It ain't wrong, though, right? It ain't, it ain't a lie. Uh-huh. Find somebody from Memphis today and ask them. That was the culture. When we moved here to Smyrna, I thought I had moved to Mayberry. Darla and I took the girls to go see one of our uh, dream teamers. She serves in production. Her name is Debbie Davis. She likes to play tennis. And so we went to go see her play tennis at Lee Victory Park. And I had never been to Lee Victory Park outside of like a big event. So every time I had gone there, there had been, you know, 30,000 people there or whatever. So we go there on like a Tuesday night. Take our kids. We go up to the tennis area. There's like eight or nine adults, all different races, all different cultural views. And they're hanging out, having a good time, playing tennis, beating
being all sweet and nice. Somebody would have got shot in Memphis, you know what I mean? And they're just all nice and talking. And I'm sitting on the bleachers, and my kids run off with Darlin. I turn around, there's this massive playground, and kids are all over the place, and they're playing. And I look to the right, and there's probably about 30 guys playing pickup basketball on these outside goals. And then I look to the left, and there was about 10 people doing yoga out on the grass. And I said, where am I? What is happening? Like, is this where the Gilmore Girls shoot their show? Like, I have, what is that place called? Where's my wife? I don't even know. I don't even know what that place is called. But like, where am I right now, right? It's just, it was just a cultural thing. And I'm just, I'm learning that, look, culture is way more than skinny jeans, okay? C- culture is not defined by color, and it's not defined by click. Culture is less what you say and more what you do. Culture is, is defined by values, And something special happens when a group of individuals who are very different come together and share the same values. I'll show you an example. I want to do an illustration. I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I want you to scream out loudly your favorite color. Okay? Whatever your favorite color is. When I say three, if you don't participate, you have to leave. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Don't leave. Uh, But but when I just loud as you can, scream out your favorite color. You ready? One, two, three. All right. Did you, did you make out anything in that? That's kind of, kind of chaos, right? Kind of, kind of wild noise, right? Now, on the count of three, I want everybody in here to whisper blue, okay? Not whisper, but just say it at a normal, normal volume. So blue is, is the, the main color of Victory Church. So when I, when I count to three, just, just say normally blue. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> See how peaceful that was? The first one was just chaotic, and that one's just peaceful because something magical happens when you get a group of individuals who all, look, we're all different, right? I was in a circle the other day with about eight of my friends at a soccer game, and everybody but me liked the movie Lord of the Rings. And I could see, like, I'm about to get jumped right here at this soccer. Like, everybody liked it. We're, we're completely different, but we all share the same values. And something magical happens when a group of individuals come together and share the same values because culture has a way of defining who we are collectively, watch this, regardless of who you are individually. So in John chapter 2, Jesus comes in and says, I've got to correct this culture. This culture is bad. I've got to correct it. In Matthew, in Matthew, there, there is, some theologians say it's the same story, but Matthew's perspective. Some theologians say that Jesus had to do this twice. So you've got John chapter 2, and then you have Matthew 21. It's the same situation. Jesus goes into the temple. He has to clean out some stuff. But in John, Jesus said something that John kind of skipped over. And in Matthew, Matthew gives more of a specific uh, uh, layout of what Jesus says. So in John, Jesus just kind of said, you're making my father's house out into a market. He just kind of went by Matthew really gets specific, and watch this. Matthew 21, 13 says, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So Jesus said, what I want my house to be is a house of prayer. This is the culture I want my house, the temple, to have, is a house of prayer. We've all got a culture that we want in our house. He said, but what it is right now is a den of robbers. So you've got what I want it to be, but you've got what the culture that we're allowing has allowed it to be, okay? So what I want it to be and what it is, what we say it's going to be and what we're actually doing. Here's what Jesus was teaching us, and we say this at Victory all the time, and I want you to get it in your spirit. Culture trumps vision. Culture will always trump vision, which means I can come in here and say, hey, I got a vision for us to do this, but if our culture doesn't back up what I'm saying, it will never come to be. In other words, you can say you want a healthy marriage, but does the culture that you're allowing create it? When you and your wife get in a fight, or you and your husband get in a fight, do you talk it out? Or do you walk away from each other and bottle it in, hoping that three or four days from now, one of you will forget? Because that's a bad culture in which you're trying to create the vision of a healthy marriage. You can want kids that know Jesus, but does the culture that you're creating and the culture that you're allowing provide that? We, we knew these families, and maybe we were youth pastors, and these kids, they had a daughter and a son, and they would come into the service, and after Sunday, they'd come down for, or after the service, they'd come down for prayer and, and what we called the altar time, and they'd be down, and the parents would walk in, and because the adult service was over, they'd walk in, they'd come down to the front row, and they'd grab their kids from praying, grab them, and walk out. 
at that age, they were creating culture. About seven years later, the father came to me and said, hey, my son nor my daughter follow Jesus. Can you help me? I said, I'm not, I can't help you. You have allowed a culture for years, and you were saying you wanted something, but your culture was doing something different, right? We can want it, but is our culture leading us into it? You can want to be financially stable, but is the culture that you're living actually allowed? Do you tithe, right? I find so many people that want something, and they don't have it, and they don't realize that it's because the culture that they are allowing and the culture they've created doesn't support it. And we cannot be so afraid to confront culture that we allow society to, di- to decide it for us. And this is what a lot of us are doing. I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, and it's very important I'm learning that I create the culture for them and that I don't allow what their friends or what their schools are telling them the culture is, but it's my responsibility to create it, right? So culture is important, and it's your responsibility to be able to identify it and correct it when it needs to be corrected. And Jesus realizes this, and here's the next thing Jesus realizes, is that since that's the case, now he has to move into protecting culture. First he walked in and said, something ain't right. This ain't supposed to be like this. So now he has to protect the house of his father. And for you and I, especially moms and dads, husbands and wives, we have to protect the culture of our family and our house. It's our responsibility to protect it. So then let's look again at John chapter 2. This is now, since preparing this message, this has become my new favorite verse in the Bible. And you're about to understand why when I'm done. All right, John chapter 2, verse 15. Let's read it again, just so you're back in the same uh, lane as me. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, and he scattered the coins of the money changers, and he overturned the tables. Here's what I loved about that verse. Jesus doesn't walk into the temple and see bad culture and go, I should go pray about this. Father, the temple does not have the culture that you wanted to. You should do something. We, that, that's not what happens, right? Y'all read the same verse I read? Okay, cool. The other thing you don't see is Jesus doesn't walk into the temple and see the bad culture and go, hey, um, excuse me, just, just wanted to bring something to your attention. Uh, my father has a specific culture that he wants. I don't really agree. I don't agree. I think what you're doing is really cool. Get your dime, you know. But, but that's what my father said, and I think we should really do what my father said, right? It doesn't happen. It says Jesus went and started, and I picture this, y'all, because when I read the Bible, I see it. I see Jesus standing in the corner putting together a whip. Can you see, can you see the disciples over there going like, what's he doing? Right? So, so again, imagine this. We, I, I, couldn't, I don't know how to put one together. So, so Jesus and his boys come walk in the temple, right? They're coming to the temple. Jesus, Jesus is like, what the? Oh, no, 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 bro. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> give me that cord. Yo, yo, Peter, give me that. Shut up. Give me that cord right there. Y'all done messed up. I picture Jesus kind of mumbling to himself while he's putting it right. Like, what you not going to do? I'm going to tell you what you not going to do up in my house. Is you, I wish you would sell some cattle up in here trying to sacrifice the money. You better, I'm about to show you why doves cry. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all don't, you don't mess up, brother. I'm, and he just puts the whip together and then he just comes in all just, oh, oh, oh. see? That's what happened. I haven't practiced this thing quite yet. I haven't practiced it for a while. How, hey, how many of y'all got moms and dads that would beat you growing up? You know what I'm talking about? Remember when spanking was not only legal, it was a necessity? Remember when your neighbor, your high school teacher, and the police officer could spank you? Remember that? You would get six spankings before you even got home. My parents would spank me, and they would talk while they're spanking me. Like, I'm a, you just, I'm a, you, you, I can't say what they would say. They weren't saying, but you, gonna, you ain't going to come home. That's how I picture Jesus. Jesus over there like, what you're not going to do is you're not going to sell. The, get get, get out of here. Ah, you know, just, just getting stuff out. Why? Why was Jesus so, so passionate? Why is he over there putting together a whip? Because Jesus does not play when it comes to culture. 
Because he understands that if he doesn't protect the culture of his father's house, that culture's going to go right, and it's going to get off, and something's going to happen. We are responsible for protecting the culture of our house. And I wonder how many things we're crying to God about that we should be standing up and protecting. How many things we've allowed to just turn our head to, oh, I don't like confrontation. Well, you better go get a whip. When you leave here today, everybody go buy a whip. Just get, not so you can actually hit anybody, but just for the actual visual representation. So when someone starts to confront your culture, someone says, hey, you really can't read your Bible. Hold on, bro. What'd you say? What'd you say? Tell me how to raise my kid again, right? I, you know, so, so, all right, so let me give you the story. Let me put this down. This is how, this is when my unsafe part comes out. And so I was at home the other day, and uh, we live in a townhouse, and behind our townhouse is kind of a community playground. And so my kids will go out and play on the playground, and there's like six or seven or eight kids in the neighborhood, and they'll go play with my kids. And so I was upstairs, but Darla had all the windows open because it felt good, right? And she's on the porch reading and watching them, and I was upstairs working or whatever. And all of a sudden, I hear my wife getting into, not an argument, but I hear her raising her voice at somebody. And so whenever I hear my, rice, my wife raise her voice, I start making whips. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I just, I was like, here I go. What, what they, what they going to say? Because I didn't know if it was a grown man. I didn't know if it was a teenager. And so I was ready to whip. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's go. And so I'm making my way down. And here's what had happened. My precious little five-year-old had made cards for everybody, little sweet little cards. I know, it's so sweet. And she was going and giving them to all the kids on the playground that just said, you know, God loves you or whatever. She got to this one kid who was brand new. He had never played with us or played with the kids ever, brand new. He took the card from her, he threw it on the ground, and then he jumped at her. Right? <laughs> Jump at my daughter one more time, right? right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to come outside, and here's what I hear the conversation. I hear my wife saying this. She's going, do you think you're tough? Like, you jumping out at my, my little girl, my sweet little girl who's making cards, do you think, you're, you, you think that makes you tough? And I'm like, oh, she is. Let me go put my whip down because she got her whip. You know what I'm saying? And so here's what I loved about it. She wasn't praying over the situation, right? She was, I didn't walk into her on the back porch going, Father, would you help me raise our child and teach this small little boy the right thing, right? She didn't go call the parents. She stood up to protect the culture. And there's a moment, I just wonder, how many things are you and I crying to God about that we just need to stand up and protect? Like, that's just not going to happen in my house. It's just, it's just the way, it's the culture of what, it's a godly culture. That's the way I'm going to treat my wife. That's the way I'm going to treat my husband. This is the culture. We messed up and took our kids to the trunk or treat at the YMCA on Thursday night. Y'all probably didn't go, but like five million people went to the trunk or treat at the YMCA. And so we get there, we're in line. I am literally uh, negotiating with my nine-year-old. I said, I will buy you 100 pieces of candy if you will just let me leave. <laughs> right now, we can go to Walmart, you pick them out. I don't, we'll buy 100, I'm not lying, 100 pieces. I'm willing to mortgage my house if, we'll just, if we can leave. Because the line was so long. So we're getting about midway. We've taken about six steps in 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, Veda goes, well, can we just skip people? And Darla and I are like, what? And she's like, come on. Just, if we can just skip people, we're like, is that what you do? Like, is that, like, where did you get that? She goes, other people do it. I said, but, but we don't do it. And, I, and there was a couple in front of us. And I said, let me ask you a question. What makes you any better than this couple right here? And, of course, she, she couldn't say anything. So we, we make another few steps. And here comes this family. had about eight kids. Family, they walked. And I knew it. Oh, I knew it. They looked at the line. And you could see that moment where they were like, nope. And they walked to the front and skipped everybody in that line. And my daughter's like, they did it. And I was like, but it's not our culture. It's not who we are. And so I stood up and protected that, right? This is who we are. Listen to me. The Christ in me should be correcting the culture around me. Am I right? Like there should just be a moment where the Christ in me applies, corrects, and protects the culture that is around me. And here's the best thing that I can tell you about this concept that you may not hear anywhere else, and I want you to put this into your mind and your spirit. You do not have to apologize for the passion behind keeping and protecting your culture. Don't apologize for it. 
every, every Sunday, we, we tear this, this down. This is a school, in case you didn't know. Um, and so we tear all of this down, and we put it up in different places, and then we come in on Friday nights, and we set it all up so you can come in and hear about Jesus. And so uh, on one Sunday, I went back to the nursery to help them break down, and our nursery director, Jenny Glimp, she, she should have came from the military. She is just so, like, like she will just, and, and so she, she puts everything in different ways for a reason, and I was just trying to hurry up and get us out of here. So I grabbed one of her carts, and I started pushing it, and she said, hey, Pastor, that doesn't, that's not ready, and she kind of got on to me a little bit, right? And I was like, okay, my goodness. And so I just pushed it back and, and went on about my way. And about 10 minutes later, she came up and she said, Pastor, I just wanted to apologize. I didn't mean to speak to you. I said, listen, don't apologize to me for being passionate about the culture you created in this nursery. I was about to break your culture. Don't apologize for that. Yell at me. I don't care. I'm a grown man. I, can t- I get yelled at by women all the time. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Protect your culture. And so, listen, this moment happens, and this is so interesting, where, where when Jesus is flipping out, right, the disciples see this. And according to the verses that we read in John chapter 2, they, it says all of a sudden they remembered. They saw their Savior go savage, and all of a sudden they remembered something. And here's what they remembered. They remembered that it was written that the zeal, of the, zeal for the house will consume me. Passion. Jesus had passion. It was already written in the word. Jesus had passion for the house of God. It's okay for you to have passion for your marriage culture, for your family's culture, for your Christian culture. It's okay for you to have a passion about protecting your culture. Because if you don't have a passion about it, somebody else will. And they will come in and create culture, and you will just adapt to what they've created. Meanwhile, we are supposed to be the ones who create it. Jesus said, I wish you would. Let me go get my whip. That needs to be our personality. Don't you mess with my culture. I will whip. And, And let me encourage you in this way. If you currently don't have the culture that you know you need, speak it until you do. Speak it until you do. When we moved here to plant Victory Church, without ever having a meeting, without even knowing if anybody cared to ever come to Victory Church, we started speaking a culture for our church that it would be a church where people, unsaved people who didn't know Jesus would come to know Jesus. We would tell people that. Say, well, what kind of church is it? They would ask us all these questions. What denomination? They'd ask us all those religious questions. I'd say, look, it's a, it's a place where people can come to meet Jesus. It's a place we didn't even have, we didn't have anything. I know we don't have a building now. We didn't even have the school. We had nothing. We had nothing, but we were speaking culture where people would be saved. To this day, 181 people have given their heart to Jesus through Victory Church. Come on. That's what you call speaking culture. We said, look, we said we want Victory Church to be the kind of place where people who have had Jesus misrepresented to them would be able to come in and re-know Jesus. That they would come in and re-know Christianity and re-know church and re-know all that. That's what this place has become. Everybody that I talk to, everybody is like, man, what I thought was this and I'm learning this. And it's changing because we spoke it before it ever actually happened. We spoke that we would be a giving church. We spoke that before it ever opened. We said, we're going to be a generous church. And we got a series coming up in two weeks where I'm going to bring to you all that we've done, all that we've done in the generosity. The fact that last year alone in our end of the year giving, we raised $19,000. That's incredible. And when I get to announce to you how much we've given away and where we're giving it away, I have so many announcements that are going to make you go, I can't believe we're, we're not even two years old. How are we doing that? Because we were speaking it before it ever was. If the culture's not what you want, speak it. I was talking to Darla, and we were with Jamal. It was me, Darla, and Jamal. And we were talking to my wife, Darla. She said, babe, you were preaching the other day? And she said, I wanted to stand up. And I said, huh? And she goes, you were just, you were going so good. I just wanted to stand up. I said, well, you should have stood up. And she goes, well, and, and then Jamal said, uh, yeah, and I, I wanted to stand up too. And she said, well, you should have stood up. He's like, well, if you'd have stood up, I'd have stood up. And she said, well, from now on, let's both stand up. And I said, listen, y'all stand up now, right? I don't know if you saw it last Sunday. We were getting into it, and they stood up. I said, stand up now when it's just two. And there'll be a time where there'll be over thousands of people in this building watching and experiencing Jesus, and hundreds will stand. Stand now so that it creates a culture for then. Listen, speak a healthy marriage. Speak yourself a promotion. Speak yourself out of doubt. Speak it. Whatever you want the culture to be, speak it. 
I understand that it is a den of robbers now. But if you will begin to speak it, protect it, and correct it, you will turn it into a house of prayer. Right? Look at the person beside you and say, watch me whip. Watch me whip. How many of you right now, you, you, you have a culture somewhere, your marriage, your kids, your family, your work, it's a den of thieves. Man, you want it changed. Start speaking it. Jesus was Jesus. And he didn't come in and change it right then. He just came in and started speaking to it. This is going to be different. I'm going to correct this. I'm going to protect this. Go get, hey, Peter, go get me my whip. We're going to change this. And look, when, when somebody says to you, you can't do that. You, you, you won't be able to change that. It's always been, I'm going to teach on this next Sunday. It's always been that way. Your mom was that way. Your dad was that way. It'll always be that way. Ooh, I'm about to destroy that. It's always been that way. Don't, don't tell them no, no. Don't, don't, don't look at them and be like, no. Don't, don't, don't even do that. Don't even do that. Tell them nay, nay. <laughs> Y'all know where I'm going with this. <laughs> tell them nay, nay. And then when you talk to people, you can be like, watch me whip. Watch me nay, nay. Right? Oh, come on now. I did that and nobody stood the whole message. I still whipped and nay nay for y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Whip and nay. Watch me whip and watch me nay nay. I'm about to protect and correct the culture in my life. It's what I've been called to do. I'm correcting it and I'm protecting it. Listen to me, husbands and wives. Correct the bad culture and start protecting it. Listen to me, parents. Correct the wrong culture and start protecting it. Listen to me, Christian. Listen to me, boss. Listen to me, coworker. Listen to me. Correct the bad culture and start protecting it. Because here's what's really cool is that once you correct the culture, miracles start to happen. I, I, I want to ask you a question. Well, before I ask you the question, I'll show you. Matthew 21 14. This is Matthew's reference again. Same situation as where Jesus said, you have turned my father's house into a den of robbers. I want it to be a house of prayer. And as you read on through Matthew 21, Jesus clears out the temple. He gets to whipping, and he gets to nay and he gets everybody out of the temple. And look, as a result of him correcting culture, according to verse 14, watch this. Then the blind and the lame came to him where? At the temple. And what? He healed them. Once he corrected the culture then the miracles could happen. Can I just tell you something out of my own personal experience? If I don't have the right culture, I can't expect miracles from my nine-year-old. The culture has to be corrected. And once I correct the culture, then I believe miracles can happen. So I did all of this to give you a question that I pray you'll ponder for seven days and then come back for part two next Sunday. And here's the question. What kind of culture do you want? What kind of culture do you want in your marriage? What, what kind of culture do you want in your home with your kids? What kind of culture do you want at your job? What kind of culture do you want with your friends? What kind of culture do you want? Because here's what's crazy. We all believe it's very important, but very few of us actually do the work. Did you know that here at Victory we have both a mission statement and a value statement? A vision statement. Some of you know some of our statements. You would know uh, you're here on purpose because you have a purpose. Some of you might know our four G's that you grow, guide, give, and go. But we also have cultural statements. Cultural statements that help kind of define as a whole who we are. And so I just like, I'll just give you a few of them. One of them is that we believe big and we ask for it. And you can say something, I, I just mentioned a minute ago, the $19,000 that we raised last year. And in about six weeks, we'll do Purpose Prevails again. And we'll believe big and we'll ask for it. And we believe God. That's just one of our cultures. People go, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, and they, he found out kind of what we were doing financially around the community. Uh, he actually works at the Second Harvest Food Bank. And he found out what we were doing in the community and what we did through Second Harvest. And he goes, and you're only just two years old? I said, yeah. He goes, man, I know churches that are 20 years old that don't give what y'all are giving. I said, well, that's what happens when it starts culturally. We believe big and we ask for it. Another one of 
I, I've talked to people before and they go, man, it feels like everybody serves at that church. Like every time, it seems like everybody serves there. That's because one of our cultural statements is that we're not, we're not consumers, we're contributors. We don't just come to take it in, but we come to give it back out, right? Another one that I love, because you'll never see the directors in our church sitting back and feet up watching other people work, because another one of our cultures is we lead from the front, not from behind. And so these are just cultural statements that I'm telling you that we put in place long before we ever even found out where we were going to have a church. And why do you do that? Because you want a bunch of different individuals to be able to come together collectively and share the same values. Your family is made up of different individuals. Your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your baby's daddy, everybody, they're, they're, they're a different individual. And you're trying to come together and share values. That's culture. And so I thought it was important for us to take a couple weeks and say, hey, we really need to think about this. We really need to ask ourselves, what kind of culture do we want? So I don't ever really do this, but, but I'm just going to end today by asking you to do me a favor. And that's over the next seven days, process that question. Maybe you need to talk to your family. Maybe you just need to get alone with yourself in a room, close the door. But ask yourself, what kind of culture do I want? Because here's the deal. You can't protect it if you don't know what it is. And you can't create it if you don't know what to create. Right? It's kind of like, would you rather have a marriage like Popeye's or like Chick-fil-A? Where it's my pleasure. The reason is culture. Lord, I thank you so much for our time together, for your word. I thank you that you are this loving Jesus that climbed on the cross and died for us. And at the same time, you are this practical Jesus that said, hey, wait a minute, things aren't right. We need to correct this. We need to change this. And God, you modeled it for us. You modeled it for us so that we could leave here today going, where in my life have I allowed society to define my culture? What areas do I need to correct and what areas do I need to protect? What areas do I need more Jesus? Lord, what I love the most about what you did in that temple is that after you cleared it out, people came, the hurting, the lame, the blind. And God, you healed them. I believe that our personal houses are supposed to be a house of prayer and a house of healing. And if we will correct the culture, our children will come and find healing. Our spouses will come and find healing. Our friends will come and find healing. Because as we correct the culture, then the miracle can happen. So I pray you'd speak to every individual in this place. You may speak to them right now. You may speak to them tomorrow as they're on the road or tonight when they lay down. But you'd begin to identify both good culture areas, man, they're doing this great and they're doing this great, and then areas that need to be corrected so that they could glorify you in every area and so they could see miracles happen all throughout their life. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said.